Nobody identifies with Captain Marvel because she didn't earn anything. She's a Mary Sue, right? She had she had everything kind of given to her, but the one character who really didn't get his redemption. If Ant-Man knew how the time travel worked, he wouldn't have become a baby and an old man when the Hulk was trying to experiment on him. It, it, was, it was only Tony Stark that knew how it worked. I think time travel is a really weak narrative. First of all, I'm going to say that every single person should go see Avengers Endgame because Avengers Endgame is the culmination of an 11 year saga of building characters, the likes of which we have never seen in the history of cinema and maybe the history of, I say the history of civilization is a little strong. There's some pretty good characters in the history of civilization, but let's say in the history of cinema, something like this probably hasn't been done. Marvel has managed to craft a universe that is amazing. And the stories they've told have followed Jungian archetype, uh, Jungian ar uh, story arcs and, and uh, archetypal storylines that have, that have stayed with us for generations and uh, compares itself to things like the original Star Wars, not the new Star Wars, the original Star Wars. TLDR, go see Endgame because Endgame is just the, 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 the finale of probably one of the most well-crafted stories ever told through a cinematic experience. Okay, that said, I didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't think it was a very good movie. Let's start from the beginning. And uh, I'm gonna have a lot of hot takes, okay? I think we're gonna make a lot of people upset, maybe. Here's the basis of my narrative theory. I think time travel is a really weak narrative and it's done badly in almost everything I can think of. I don't know how Captain Marvel found Tony Stark and Nebula and like how that worked. That was weird. And then they go back to Earth. Um, Captain Marvel like, I guess sort of joins them, but then she's like, Captain Marvel like was like a bad Superman in this whole thing where it's like, we have to keep this person artificially out of the story because she's so powerful that she trivializes the encounter. So we're only going to bring him, her in at like this incredibly obvious finale when it's like, all hope is lost. The army is winning. Ah, and then it's like, dun, 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 dun. Who do you think it is? I don't know. Maybe it's, a, oh, 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 it's Captain Marvel. And she just destroyed the capital ship and then won the, whoa, okay, cool. I never saw that coming. Oh, wow. Yeah, right? Like that was like a really, like this character, right when you establish the power of Captain Marvel in as it relates to uh, the, the, the MCU, you have a problem. You have the Superman problem. So you have to like, her, her like, how she's integrated into the story is gonna be really hard. So she's basically, um, is that is the term deus ex machina, which is like what she's wherever the story needs her to be. So, okay, so she's like the powerful enough thing to reg rescue like Nebula and Tony Stark. But it's like, so she's wherever the plot needs her to be. So she's basically like a filler, right? It's like, okay, we need someone to destroy this like massive army because nobody's really powerful enough to do it. Here's something that would have been really cool. Thor actually finds himself in this movie and comes back and is the one that actually takes on the like capital ship and stuff because we had a perfect story arc for that to happen, right? This is one of my big complaints with Avengers Endgame. There are so many storylines that 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 got like at least like you know um, Tony Stark like ends up with his father. That's like great. Um, Captain Mar uh, or uh, Captain America and Tony Stark like end up being friends again. That's great too. But there are so many other arcs that could have happened, like Thor coming back from being this sort of like like Thor getting redeemed through his mother and having like a montage like Rocky training session to come. back back as like a god and then actually doing that would have felt so much better than Captain Marvel just flying in from outer space and blowing up the capital ship without any trouble. So they return to Earth and join the reigning Avengers. Um, Captain Marvel's character development is really limited. She, here, here's, here's how she joins the Avengers. She stands in front of Thor. Thor reaches out his hammer. The hammer comes to her hand and then she doesn't flinch. So Thor's like, this one's all right. And now she's in the Avengers. We fast forward basically from there to five years later and she's like a member of the crew. But she doesn't ever really do anything because she's like, well, there's thousands of planets that uh, uh, need my help. And like, so she's not like really doing anything. And so the, so, so then like we find Thanos 
at the end of this, and Thanos dies. And I think I'm okay with this. This is this is like pretty cool because you don't know the context of it. But then it's it's like how else is this gonna happen if it's not time travel from here? Like, okay, so so Th Thanos dies, Thor kills him, and then it's just like five years later, and here's where the movie starts to really go downhill for me. So this period of time is two f fucking hours in the movie, okay? It's two hours, and it's, it's, it's so slow. The pacing is so slow at first, and I understand, like, Avengers apologists are going to be like, well, they had to set it up to give, like, a sort of feeling of despair, a feeling of sort of loss. And there's like, you have to believe that the characters think there is nothing you, they can do. Tony Stark has moved on. Black Widow is basically like a wreck. Everybody, like Captain America is in a support group. They're all just sort of trying to figure out how to survive with this reality. And that's a cool subtext. That's a cool sub element, but it doesn't culminate in anything at the end of the film. It doesn't add any kind of redeeming factor to the fact that they actually, because they just end up reversing everything anyway. So all that stuff doesn't mean anything. So I sat in a theater for two hours trying to plan my pee breaks around how much water I drink, basically for a really slow pacing. And this is the biggest problem I had with the film, was the first two hours were very slow. They paced extremely slow and nothing really got accomplished. Um, the things that did get accomplished didn't make like a lot of sense. So, so, so like... Um, there's supposed to be this really big impact from like removing half of the universe, right? But it never really culminates because everybody just sort of warps back into existence at the end. And what's so super weird about it is that um, there's been five years between like, okay, maybe in five years, like uh, my, my wife gets disappeared, right? And then I'm like, you know, I kind of want to kind of want to meet someone else. And then my wife shows up five years later and she's back. And I'm like, Oh shit. <laughs> like, what am I going to do? I got, to, right? Like, none of that stuff is addressed. There's like a lot of problems. Like, everyone just goes back to school, I guess. But everybody that was in school is five years later in school. So, aren't they in high school or college now or whatever? I, I don't know. Okay. A lot of problems there. Anyway, Scott Lang escapes the quantum realm. The way that he escapes the quantum realm is a rat clicks a button and he pops out of his van because the person, the wasp, I guess, was, was um, controlling his journey through the quantum realm. And then he got lost in it. And then the wasp got disappeared when he was in it. So he stayed in it. Then the rat hit the button. He comes back out. And somehow this, this makes Ant-Man realize that there's time travel. This is super weird because when they go to Tony Stark, Tony Stark already knows this, but he's ruled it out because he thinks it's impossible. And basically it's like this, okay? Tony Stark already knows like all the quantum stuff and he's like, ah, it's just, it's not going to happen. Like, and then Scott's like, come on, come on. And then like Tony Stark's like, ah, I got a daughter, dude. I don't know. And Scott's like, come on, you know, like save everybody. Come on. And Tony's like, ah, okay. All right. And then they do it. Like what? Like if, if, if it was such a big deal to do it, then like, why wouldn't you have done it before? It's so weird that like Tony didn't, um, rule out those possibilities. Ant-Man didn't assist. Ant-Man didn't tell Tony Stark anything. He ar he already didn't already know. Right. All that happened was um, all that happened was Tony Stark just ran the simulation. Then then came to the conclusion. If you remember, Tony went back in 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 the movie. He went back and he actually told them what was going on. So all this was like really contrived. Okay. Tony didn't know it was possible to go to a specific point in time and do as possible a time travel to random amount. Yeah, and then he ran a simulation which Ant Man didn't help with. The, his simulation was in his house. And he ran a simulation that was like, oh, I can do it. Then he went and told everyone, okay, listen to me. If Ant-Man knew how the time travel worked, he wouldn't have become a baby and an old man when the Hulk was trying to experiment on him. It was, it was only Tony Stark that knew how it worked. 
it, from the beginning. So Tony Stark did everything. He already he already knew about all that shit. He just he just didn't run the simulation. It was literally Ant Man's only role was to come back to reality through a rat and be like, "Hey, you should think about this more." And he's like, "Ah, okay." And then he ran the simulation, and then he got it. So now they determine that they are going to go back in time and that they have to go recover the Infinity Stones before Thanos gets them. So they actually addressed in the movie, why not just go back to when Thanos is a baby and actually kill him? And then they're like, well, because time travel doesn't work that way. And they're all, and then they just leave it. <laughs> and then it just gets, and that's just the end of it. And I'm like, wait, what, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> um, so it just doesn't work that way. And then you, they, they figure out they have these limited amount of PIM particles because PIM doesn't exist in this time. And they can only go back, right? So they go back, they, they go back into the time mission. Okay. From a narrative element, this is really weak. From a, from a just cinematic element, this is so cool to go back through the old movies. This is where stuff started to get awesome for me. It's so like the, the um, last like hour of the movie started to, I, I, I really enjoyed that more than I enjoyed like the first two hours. So now like they're going back through time and you get to actually, they actually do like a throwback to like all the movies they did, like the original Avengers. Uh, this is like really cool. All the affinity stuff. This is so well done in my opinion. And then the first one is Banner comes back to the Sanctum Satorum and sees the ancient one. This is the, my favorite scene in the movie for a bunch of reasons. The ancient one is like, I'm not giving you the stone. Banner is like, I'm taking the stone then. Like, this is not a negotiation. Ancient One's like, sure, dude. Bam! And just wrecks him. <laughs> it's just like, whoa. Like, he's completely powerless, right? When Banner lands and says, I'm looking for Doctor Strange, the Ancient One goes, Doctor Strange is still practicing medicine about 20 blocks that way. Um, he'll be available in five years, which is so cool because that means the Ancient One knew everything about this timeline from the beginning. In Doctor Strange 1, all of that she knew already. She was training Doctor Strange, pretending to resist his training, all that stuff she knew because she knew that it was necessary for Doctor Strange's journey. That was one of the coolest things that, that they tied back in. I really, really loved that, that the Ancient One like had that knowledge and was like this sort of like vastly powerful gatekeeper. But when Banner tells her, Doctor Strange gave Thanos the stone, the Ancient One is like, I was the one that made the mistake. I'm, I'm the one that's that like, in, in my vision of reality, I didn't give the time stone to Banner. That's wrong, because Doctor Strange knows something that I don't. And then understanding that gives him the time stone. That was an awesome story element. That was super, super cool. Um, I really, really love this part of the movie. And uh, the whole thing with the Ancient One was just so cool, and it tied back so well into the whole story of Doctor Strange, which was, like, so enjoyable. What we don't know is... Here, here, okay, we're going to do some big brain stuff. If the Ancient One gives the Time Stone to Banner... Banner travels into the future, gets the Infinity Gauntlet. Iron Man uses the gauntlet. Everything comes back to normal. Captain America returns the stone to the exact same time. Doctor Strange doesn't have the stone in the future. Does he get the stone again? Because the Ancient, Man, the ancient One would have given him the stone in the past. <laughs> okay. Does he have the stone in Doctor Strange 2? It's actually really hard. <laughs> okay. Because he might have the stone in Doctor Strange 2 because the Ancient One would have given it to him later because events would have proceeded as normal. Um, because the whole point of returning the stones to their exact instance was to prevent the phrase in, in, in time, right? This is a huge, huge problem. So the Ancient One says, if I give up the Time Stone to help your reality, I'm dooming my own. The Infinity Stones create what you experience as a flow of time. Remove one of the stones and that flow splits. Now this may benefit your reality, but my new one, not so much. 
In this new branch reality, without our chief weapon against the force of darkness, our world will be overrun. Millions will suffer. So tell me, Doctor, can your science prevent all that? The reason they return the stones, I think, is to prevent any of those realities from stopping, right? So in the current MCU, if the Ancient Ones said that the Infinity Stones create what you experience as the flow of time, and you, if you remove the stones, you're screwed, and the stones are gone in the MCU, how is our MCU timeline going to survive without the Infinity Stones? So there's no, there's no answer. Yeah, there's there's no answer to that, right? So that that's that's a very big problem. Um, yeah, it's a good question, right? Exactly. Okay, so so <laughs> there's no answer to that. Um, it's just a giant ass plot hole, and that's my big that's my big problem with the movie, is uh, that 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 this happened, right? Uh, the other really big problem with the movie is the um, the. Uh, Pym particles. That's a very easier one to criticize, right? Which is like, they could have gone back to 1970 at any time, gotten the Pym particles, and then they would have just had infinite time travel. And then now, they effectively do have infinite time travel. So how is that going to work? They have infinite time travel now. Right? Because, because Pym is still alive. We saw him in the end scene. And they can make infinite ones. So, I mean, the only thing that could happen there is like, well, I guess we just won't use this power because now we have, so that's like a way bigger, that's a way easier thing to criticize, right? They could have gone back to the 1970s in the first place, gotten the infinite ones, and then they wouldn't have had to worry about this stuff in general. They could have just been like, oh, we screwed that one up. Let's like go back and blah, blah, blah. It's just a bunch of BS. So that's, that's like a big problem. I, I almost think that criticizing the movie for its time travel is like, weak because we already know that this is like there's no disagreement that this is like a super weak i, I don't think anyone would disagree that the the narrative for time travel is like really weak okay let's keep going so they do this like time mission thing which is like pretty cool again like going back and seeing the old movies like that's like really good then uh they get the reality stone uh then he gets mueller back which is like super cool they go and they go to the, the Soul Stone Keeper, the Red Skull, and then they have to sacrifice, like, who, they could only sacrifice someone they love, um, which, I, which I guess, like, is weird because, like, they fight over which one should die, but do they love each other, too? Is that a thing? Anyway, it ends up that Black Widow dies. This was great. It's also super good that she couldn't be brought back because it adds some kind of, like, consequence to the universe. They get the Soul Stone, and then they return to the present but Nebula is like still there because she's connected via Wi-Fi to the other Nebula, which then opens up the third biggest plot hole with the movie, which is the whole Thanos comes to reality thing, right? So the whole way to get to reality or to the timeline, you have to have a specific suit. You have to have a vial for a round trip and then you have to have um, the GPS system that gets you to navigate through. So then we go to Thanos, who has a giant capital ship, and he just warps through with Nebula's Pym particle. So what the f <laughs> right? Like, what happened there? Um, basically, Thanos is able to just, like, come through because Nebula stays back and is like, I have the Pym particle. And the only explanation for this is, like, Thanos' scientists figure out a way to do it, I guess. You know, okay, all right, whatever. But, like, it ends up being, like, really weird. So, anyway, that's, like, a big thing. So Thanos comes back, and, like, Thanos is in the, in the future now. And Thanos, so Banner uses them to restore, I guess, Thanos does the Dragon Ball Z thing and wishes back half of the people that were all killed, and they all come back. I think that it works. And then, like, seconds later, Thanos attacks the Avengers compound, right? 
what follows is like one of the best battle scenes in cinematic history. And when the wizard portals opened up, I got so stupidly pumped. I was like, oh my God, this is so awesome. Um, I don't know how like everybody was just like ready to go. Like they had like whole armies just like ready to go to like March end. Cause it only been like five minutes since they were back after five years. But that was, that was really, really neat. And then we saw like a lot of like really great scenes. So, um, Doctor Strange, I, at first I thought I was like, man, so my favorite hero, like Doctor Strange didn't actually get to do much. And then I realized like, okay, there were really two scenes of Doctor Strange. One, he floats in and he just like gravity beams like, I don't know, 50 guys. And I'm like, that's cool. And then he's like, wait, wait a minute, peace. And he goes and stops like a, like a, he stops like an entire flood. And I'm like, man, Doctor Strange didn't do that much this fight. And then I realized, wait, Doctor Strange saved the entire battlefield. Because if the flood had actually hit the battlefield, the whole battle would have been over. So Strange like, <laughs> Strange like just saved everybody. Um, and he wasn't actually like participating in the, in the whole battle. So that was awesome. The, the, f the whole thing where Captain America gets Mjolnir, it, it was, it was awesome. And then we see, one of the coolest fight scenes ever where Captain America just one-on-ones Thanos. I'm going to make a really hot take. I think that Avengers focused a lot on trying to force diversity into the film and that this took away from the narrative element. And I'm going to explain this, okay? So let's, let's start with the Captain America scene. This is awesome. Captain America like finally redeems himself. He grabs the Mjolnir. He um, is taking on, Th on, on, on Thanos one-on-one, -on -one, who like even like a bunch of seasoned heroes could not do. And then immediately, Thanos, like right about after that, Thanos just like wastes him, right? And then like Scarlet Witch saves Captain America. Um, and Scarlet Witch is a really powerful champion. I keep calling him champions. They're a really powerful hero, right? Um, and she's the only person to actually really um, give Thanos, like, a run for her money. But I feel like, because, like, she, like, locked him up, and then, like, like Thanos had to orbital strike the entire battlefield. And then, by the way, like, the wizard shields that, like, came up as a result of that was so cool. Like, orbital strike the whole battlefield in order to, like, just stop Scarlet Witch, because Scarlet Witch is, Scarlet Witch should be that strong, like, from the, from the, uh, from the comic books and stuff. She should be, like, the strongest, one of the strongest people on the battlefield, and she was. And that was, re and that was really good. Um, It, but but then like I think Scarlet Witch like took away something from Captain America there. I feel like Captain America like didn't have his moment. He got like really beaten down, and it it didn't. I don't know. It just it just didn't show. Then we like go into the scene where like all the women get together because <laughs> they're all on the same place on the battlefield, and then they they go. Um, they, uh, they, they go forward. I'm going to make the argument, the incredibly unqualified argument, because I'm, an, I'm a privileged white male, that um, you don't need the scene. the scene. The scene actually, in my opinion, weakens the role of women in the series because you already have a ton of really strong women that are their own heroes that have been well-developed in the MCU. You have Captain Marvel, which everyone knows. That's like the biggest example of it. But you also have the, um, the uh, lady from the Black Panther, right? Who's like really, really cool and like awesomely strong. And she's like this assassin, like that she was like, like that was really cool. You have Scarlet Witch, who's a great character. There are so many, you have the Valkyrie. There are so many women who stand on their own as these great heroes that don't need any help, that are like really powerful. And like, I think like you, that all women scene, for some reason I was like, come on. Cause like it just, it took away from the power that you needed that because these, these women are already standing alone as like really strong elements of the MCU universe. That, that scene really bothered me. It bothered me more than it should have. So here are the here are the arcs that you have to finish. You got to finish Iron Man, and that that went great. Iron Man arc finished. Iron Man arc couldn't be better. Oh man, the scene where Strange looks across to to, to Tony Stark, and Stark realizes what he has to do. And when Strange is like, "If I told you what was going to happen, you it wouldn't happen." That was so good. That was so good, man. Holy, that was good. It was great. Iron Arc, literally perfect. Just so good. Oh, man. The whole thing was great. Captain America, 
I actually, I actually am totally okay with his arc. Like, I, I like that he like went back, spent that time with his love, and like after accomplishing like that mission, he was good. Like he found his peace. I think that was also really good. Hulk story wasn't really told. He became like um, Hulk is weird. Like you five years later, you just come in and it's like he's the Hulk, but he's also Banner. That felt like a sort of cop out. But the one character who really didn't get his redemption was Thor. And, and that sucks. That, that, that sucks so bad. Because, like, Thor getting... Thor having three movies and then being the dude that, like, is supposed to, like, come back. Oh, man. Like, I, I get it. I get it. It's like, oh, yeah, he's going to get his redemption. And then, like, the, and, like the, his whatever his next movie is. Okay. I, the, and that's going to be great. I don't know. I just... I just feel like you could have had a mini redemption of Thor by taking Captain Marvel. At, this is the one thing I would have changed. Have Thor destroy the capital ship. Like he realizes himself, he, he, get, he earns it back, he destroys the capital ship. Giving that to Captain Marvel feels bad. I think if I had to summarize it, there were some really awesome parts of this movie, but... Time travel really takes away from any narrative element. And a lot of characters got their... But this, what this movie should have been about was characters finally redeeming their arcs, right? But I feel like what we got instead was like two hours of really, really slow pacing. Or like an hour and a half of like really slow pacing. A lot of plot holes. And... At the end of the day, like a lot of like questions about like where the I, I, I think like they're just gonna get like swept under the rug like up oh, like let's forget about that stuff because the the MCU is just gonna not address these issues because it can't address these issues so like these the issues that I brought up of like um, infinite time travel um, how 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 that stuff works now like uh, the Infinity Stones like not existing so how does the universe exist like things like that um, all these like uh, these like different problems right. Overall, um, I don't know. I would say on my scale, I would probably rate it maybe a 6 out of 10. 5.5 to 6 out of 10.